And from the tribe, I'm going to create a nation. The nation Israel. God wrestlers. People who struggle with and for God. And they are going to redeem the world. And that takes us to the Abraham story. The flood failed. Abraham is the third Adam. He begins again with Abraham. And there he has some more success. Not solving the problem of sin, but at least giving us the mechanism to solve it with the sacred literature and all that comes through Moses and the rest. And then from the Christian point of view, of course, you move on from that to another Adam, who is Jesus, who acts as an individual in the way that the people Israel act in the Old Covenant, to be a redeemer for the whole world. And so you have, in a sense, a fourth Adam there. Paul said Jesus was the second Adam. I think, really, if you read it in more detail, he's the fourth. God has chosen many ways to try to bring us back to him and solve the, part, the, the problem of Eden. All right, so that's, those are the characteristics of the J source. And then last week we went over the bottom paragraph of chapter two, which goes on to cha uh, page two, which goes on to page three. The actual list of events, the synopsis of J, beginning with Adam and Eve, now, today our Bibles begin with the six-day creation story because the P authors stuck that in in the beginning as an as, as a introduction to the whole Bible. But at one point, the J scroll began with in the day that the Lord God made the heaven and the earth. And that's the beginning, excuse me, the earth and the heaven. And that's the beginning of the Garden of Eden story. But P in 550 BC stuck in the six days. Very different. We have two creation stories here, and we're going to start perhaps in a minute to look at the two and compare them. They're quite different. And it's the differences that made scholars in the middle of the 19th century say, you know, we have two different authors here. If Moses wrote both, everybody believed Moses wrote the five books. And if Moses wrote the six day creation story, in which man is created, then the animals, no, excuse me, when the animals are created, then man and woman as partners. And he also wrote the Garden of Eden story, in which man is created, then the animals, then woman, not to be his partner, but to be his helper. You've got two different authors. In the first story, God says, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, I want you and this woman to have sex and produce children. In the second story, when they discover their sexuality, God is appalled and exiles them from Eden. Which, how could the same man have written both stories? Both are true, both have great truths about what happens in the family when children discover their sexuality. And we'll read them with, try to get some insight into that because these are stories about us and our life. But they're two very different points of view. And so they began to say, you know, the same man couldn't have written these two stories. And one story says God, G-O-D, which in Hebrew is Elohim, and the other one says, Y-A-H-W-E-H, Lord. Why would he use one name for God here and another name here? Must be two authors. And that began what's called the documentary hypothesis, that the five books are written by f the uh, four schools of writers which produced separate documents which later were united into the first five books and Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, but mainly the first five books, J, E, D, and P. All right, they began to look at the Bible the way you look at any ancient literature and not being afraid. The first man who came up with the theory that Moses didn't write it, didn't dare to produce, his name was Rhymaris, he didn't dare to produce it during his lifetime. He would have been burned at the stake. But he died and then his daughter produced it and people were scandalized. You mean Moses didn't write the whole thing? Fundamentalist Christians and Orthodox Jews are still horrified by that suggestion, and they will not accept it. But biblical scholarship has accepted it for, since the 1850s. And that's the point of view that I, as a college professor, have to teach from. All right, so we go through the Genesis narrative. At the end, the Israelites settle in Egypt, and they're welcomed by the government. But then when we read Exodus, also J.E. material, the story continues, middle of page three. Israel is enslaved, the story of Moses, God versus Pharaoh at the Red Sea and the 10 plagues, then the Exodus and the 10 commandments at Sinai. And then right in the middle of Exodus, you have all this P material, this priestly material starting. 
and then we go back to numbers their wanderings in the desert then after we finish the five books we have je material in joshua the conquest of canaan crossing the jordan the conquest of canaan and then uh, a big covenant renewal ceremony at the end of joshua where they get together and pledge their loyalty to god again then the book of judges how they defend the land they've just won and then we move on to samuel also j and e material reworked by the deuteronomic historians the story of samuel and how he anoints king saul as the first king of israel how saul failed as king after 20 years then david's anointing he was a very successful king in his public life although corrupt in his private life but he pays for that and he repents god still loves him david's reign and then the david davidic court theology which says that a king of israel of david's line will always be on the throne of israel which is why jews expect a messiah of david's line and, and uh, christians say that jesus was of david's line and the messiah has to be that's uh, those kinds of ancestral things are not that important to modern americans but to traditional believers they're very important it says in the bible that the redeemer will ultimately be of david's line so in both judaism and christianity we still have the echo of the davidic court theology that the king ultimately who will through whom god will redeem the world is a descendant of david the e scroll page five uses the term elohim rather than j rather than the yahwh name it begins as i said with abraham it's more nationalistic it doesn't begin with creation it begins with abraham the founder of the israelite people there might have been earlier chapters lost but we don't have them they e tells the same remember e is written in the north it tells the same stories as j but in a shorter more clipped less dramatic way uh, god doesn't contact man as directly as he does in the j text angels or dreams can convey god's will to people so he's more remote and we don't get that inner psychological picture of god's personality that you have in j e explains events j explains people the stories are parallel and e is always much briefer and i would say marginally less interesting and less dramatic than j the storyline of e it's rather fragmented but it's now been dropped paragraphs of e have been dropped into the middle of the j story god's covenant with abraham abraham and sarah and gerar which we'll read about the expulsion of hagar and her son ishmael when abraham's legitimate son isaac is born the binding of isaac a version of abraham commanded to sacrifice his only beloved son and j gives us part of that story and he gives us another part and it's now mixed up sentence by sentence the jacob's ladder dream which is both in e and j uh story of how jacob had his children both e and j jacob flees from his father-in-law laban goes back home and at bethel his name is changed from jacob to israel the j story is the wonderful wrestling match story the e story god just says your name is changed so you see there's less drama there and but the big chunk of e material is from chapter 37 i hope you all can read roman numerals chapter 37 of genesis to the end of the book it's all e almost all e because joseph they're the joseph stories abraham isaac jacob joseph the jo joseph was not only an individual who led the people into egypt and became the prime minister of egypt under the pharaohs but he was the founder of the tribe of joseph which was the largest northern tribe so the e version of the joseph stories is going to be prominent because they're interested in joseph's life j less so in the j version of the joseph stories judah is the hero in the e version reuben is the hero judah is the major southern tribe 
in the south where the JTEX was produced, Reuben was the second biggest northern tribe after Joseph, and so he is featured in the E version. So you have different versions of who did the good deeds in the Joseph stories, and we'll read them in detail. Uh, and one says it was Judah gets all the credit, and the other gives all the credit for the same acts to Reuben, which is right. We don't know which is right. You have different interpretations. So you, I have the J in page six, we've got the J version of the Joseph stories and the E version. And you see where they differ. Even words are different. There's an incident with the traveling bags of Joseph's brothers. He, the J version calls them bags. The E version calls them sacks. sacks. And there are other differences in the story. And we'll read both as we read them together. And somebody, as I said, in 700 BC combined the two together. I don't know if they did us a favor, because now you have a paragraph from G and J and a paragraph from E, J, E, J, E, and the story is repetitive. But people never noticed until scholars began to say, well, wait a minute, this paragraph doesn't agree with that paragraph. Got to be more than one author. It was an excruciating work of a century to untangle these books. And again, most of the Bible's readers today, we read it for inspiration, they're not even aware of it. And there's no reason why they should know it. But if you take a course like this, you'll learn it. All right. We won't talk about the D scroll on page 7, because we're not going to get to Deuteronomy in this course. And the rewriting of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, the Deuteronomic history. If I'm able to do it later in the summer, I'll be teaching a course in the temple... Uh, Beth Elohim on Hazel Street, down the street here, between King and Meeting, for five nights or six nights, if I can, on Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and King. So if you're interested in the Deuteronomic history, uh, that's the place to go in, in July. I'll announce that. That'll be probably on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. And then the Priestly Scroll, which is mainly the second half of Exodus, all of Leviticus, and the beginning of Numbers. And we won't get to that, but we, what we will see is the priestly contribution to the book of Exodus. The first six, the first chapter of the six-day creation, and then the bridge passages. Because originally in the J.E. version, you have disparate stories. It jumps from Eden to Cain and Abel to uh, Noah's flood to the Tower of Babel. But what the priestly authors did, who are very orderly in their thinking, they did what we call the bridge passages, the begats. Now, the begats are very boring. And so-and-so begat that, blah, 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 and then he begat him, and he begat him. But for scholars, it's fascinating. The names are very interesting. But those begats, which tell us about the generations between the main stories, that connects it into an ongoing narrative. And that's what P did. That was when the last things done uh, when they put the Bible together and the Torah together and they put an introduction to it which is the six-day creation story and they wrote their own version of Noah's flood one version says the animals went in two by two as I said last week and the other version says seven by seven clearly two different authors one says Jay says the reason for the flood was sexual impropriety there Jay is big on sexual impropriety and P says, no, it was violence. So why was the world destroyed? Improper sex or violence? Well, sex and violence keep television going and best stuff to read about. But it's one of the two. We don't know which one. You have two different theories. Asking which is the true theory is a fruitless undertaking. One author says one thing, one author says another. We have ancient stories. They're all good. They're all valuable. They all teach lessons but they don't all agree with each other. And I think this enriches, this does not, for me, take away from the sanctity of the Bible. It enriches it, because you have all these points of view, ultimately all of them true, but coming at the human dilemma from a different problem, when you th from a different point of view. When you think about it, the human problem that we have of sin or misbehavior and our complicated psyches and why we do what we do which we can't account for generally, is so complicated that no book can ever get to all of it. 
So the more sources and more interpretations and more ways to approach the human dilemma that we live in, the better. And they all add something to our understanding. So this multiple authors theory, this documentary hypothesis, I think is very helpful. Uh, all right, and the, the P authors put the whole thing together and then edited it. And we might as well say that Ezra in 428 was the last of the P authors and he brought the completed five books, so-called of Moses, to Jerusalem. And perhaps they should be called the five books of Ezra, but Moses gets the credit for them. And he, the Ten Commandments probably go back to Moses and other fragments, but the totality of it was about 600 years after, well, more than 800 years after Moses. Moses about, the Exodus is 1290 BC, more or less, and Ezra is 428 BC. Yes? Uh, Ezra, he wrote, rewrote the books after Josiah. Yes, he edited the whole thing in Babylon. Josiah 620 BC, but the final five books that we find in the beginning of the Old Testament, we have to thank Ezra for that. He put them together, he edited them, he divided them into books, and those are the five books we have today. And then the other authors, the prophets and others, produced the other 34 books of the Old Testament. Okay, any questions? Yes, ma'am. You're right. Abraham is the father of many nations. He is seen as the ultimate father by the Jews, but also by the Muslims, the Arabs. So we're cousins, which is why, of course, we get along so well. Uh, so Abraham, you're quite right, is a father. Actually, Avraham means father of nations. Am means nations. Av means father. So God took his name Avram, which means high father, and changes to Avraham, which is father of nations. So you're quite correct. His son, Isaac, is really the father of the Israelites, although they weren't called Israelites, quite right about that, until Isaac's son, Jacob, has his name changed to Israel. But so the name came two generations later, but the process of choosing this people to be a blessing to the world, which is what God said to Abraham, you, I said, he said, go to a land that I will show you, that's Israel, and I will make you a great nation. The Jews are not great because they have great numbers. Even today, there are less than 15 million Jews in the world. But they're great because they bear a great idea. The idea of ethical monotheism, one God, and you serve God by treating his children with compassion and caring and living a life of prayer, repentance, and righteousness. That's what the Jewish religion, what the Christian religion is about. And it started with Abraham, but it didn't get its name as Israel, God wrestler, until the third generation of, of Jacob who became Israel. Quite correct. Okay, so then when um, Abraham's people called the Hebrews Yes, he was called, he was one of the Habiru. The Habiru were, it means a wanderer. He was a wanderer. He didn't have, he was not a, a camel nomad. He was called a donkey nomad. These are people who didn't live in the deep desert, but they lived on the fringe of society. And what Abraham wanted more than anything else was a, a son and land. And God gave him both. And so he was one of the Habiru. That's not a racial designation. It's a, it's a kind of class of wanderers. He settled down in Israel. And God said, this is your land. And they were called first Habiru, Hebrew, then Israelite. Then when the nation split in half, Judah in the south and Israel in the north, the people in the south began being called Jews. But it's a continuum from Hebrew to Israelite to Jew. But the Arabs also see themselves as descended from the Habiru. It's with Isaac that the, that the specifically Jewish history begins because Isaac's brother Ishmael is the father of the Arab peoples. So again, we're cousins, but both children of Abraham. Yes, ma'am. With regard to Jewish and Christian theology, how, what is the status now of their differences in regard to a Messiah? You have to read my book. One of the chapters <laughs> is that 
the, my second chapter is the question of the Messiah. Uh, and I get into it in great depth. The, the Jews in the first century were desperate. They were occupied by the Romans. As if our country were occupied by the Soviets or somebody, we would, of course, want to be free more than anything else. And so they spun ideas of a Messiah that God would send to redeem them. And various groups, there were a dozen different Messiah concepts. Various Jewish groups produced different concepts of a Messiah. Christianity was one of those groups. They called themselves Jews in Christ. Remember, every author of the New Testament, with the exception of Luke, is Jewish. All Jesus' disciples were Jewish. He, of course, was Jewish. They lived and died as Jews. But they were Jews who believed that the Messiah was one who uh, suffered and died for the redemption of the sins of the world. Now, that was not the idea of most of the Jews. They believed that the Messiah would come and throw out the Romans and establish a kingdom, an independent Jewish kingdom, under a descendant of David, and his kingdom would have no end, and brotherhood and love and peace would spread to the whole world. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't promise to do it. But in Christianity, what, he did, what Jesus does is change the world soul by soul. And in Christianity, they recognize that he did not fulfill the general Jewish expectation so that we talk about a second coming. And in his second coming, he will do what he didn't do at his first coming. First, he comes as a humble servant to give his life. Secondly, he comes with clouds of glory, with angels, the Son of Man coming with angels and clouds from the sky. And that Christians expect a second coming of Christ where he will fulfill the expectations that the Jews have had. Now, for many years, the Christians wanted to convert the Jews to Christianity, and the Jews said, well, but Jesus didn't do the things that we believe the Messiah has to do. And the Christians said, well, but you got it wrong. He was not supposed to, he'll do it on his second coming. So the Jews said, well, when he has a second coming and does it, then we'll get on board. <laughs> and so a friend of mine who's an Episcopal priest says, the difference between the Jews and the Christians is this. The Jews say when the Messiah comes, they'll say, here he comes. And the Christians will say, here he comes again. <laughs> so if Jesus comes in glory, I'll certainly get on board and you'll say to me, you see, you Jews who are wrong, you held out and you didn't believe. I said, no, we were right then. Now he's coming and doing what he should do. And now we'll, now we'll be right again by joining up. So it's a, it's a question of what you mean by the Messiah. There's also another issue. I think the main issue of, that separates Judaism and Christianity is the issue of original sin. Now, that's my theory, and I develop it in the, in the book. Uh, Christ, Jews believe that the sin of Adam and Eve got us into a bad habit to choose self rather than God, and knowing what's right to do what we feel like doing like a willful child, which is what we are morally. So we did wrong. And so to solve that problem, after failing with Noah to create a new sinless world, God chose Abraham and gave Abraham's descendant Moses and the people Israel the Torah. He created the people Israel as a redemptive nation to witness to the world, not to make everybody Jewish, but to make everyone ethical, to obey the moral law of loving thy neighbor and acting that out. And once that happens, the world will be the kingdom of God. So Jews believe they are part of a, a people who is sent here to redeem, to upbuild the kingdom of God, to redeem the world. And our membership in the people Israel, guided by Torah that Moses brought, according to tradition, down from Mount Sinai and Ezra, I think, actually did it. But the point is, the Torah is our ethical guide. And if we follow the Torah, we can conquer sin. So Judaism believes sin is something that we do. And what you do, you can stop doing with enough willpower and devotion to God, prayer, repentance, righteousness, obeying this book, we can conquer sin. Christianity says, good try, but it doesn't work because sin is not what we do alone. Sin is what we are. 
when Adam and Eve sinned, they fell. There is no fall in Judaism. Nature, the world, their nature collapsed into sin and death, and sin and death spread and engulfed the world. This is Paul's theory, and he was the first and greatest Christian theologian. We became sin. Our motivation is sinful. Even if we do the right thing, we do it for the wrong reason, for self-aggrandizement. Why did you save the old lady from being hit by the truck? So she'll look up at you and say, oh, what a wonderful fellow you are, and I love you, and you, we honor you, and you're so good. And you say, gee, I guess I am. Well, that kind of self-interest haunted Paul. And therefore, the worst sin to overcome is to do the right thing for the wrong reason. So in Christianity, sin is a much more profound problem. It's not what we do only, it's what we are. You can ch change what you do, you can stop doing. But you can't stop being what you are. So we cannot help ourselves. We need a divine intervention more than to give us the Bible. We need God to become man and to live a perfect life and to then offer up his life as a sacrifice for our sins so that God takes us as sinners and he puts the sacrifice of Christ at the bottom of our list of sins and we are now treated like God as if we weren't sinners because of the sacrifice of his son on our behalf. So that's a totally different notion than in Judaism because Judaism doesn't have original sin. The death of Jesus is just a tragedy, the death of any great prophet or great man, the death of Martin Luther King, the death of Mahatma Gandhi, but Jews don't see that it has anything to do with the problem of other people's sin because we don't believe in original sin. We have to do that on our own steam following the Bible's guidelines. So that's the real difference. If you believe in original sin, then you need a tremendous divine intervention to solve the problem. If you don't believe in it, you believe sin is what we do, not what we are, then you can solve it by following the teaching in the Bible. So there are two different theories of sin and two different theories of how sin is conquered. One through Torah and obedience to Torah and one through Christ, who is Torah made flesh. After all, Christ is the word made flesh. But it's a different process. In Judaism, you start doing good and it filters inward until your motivation is purified. Paul says that doesn't work. First, Christ has to purify your motivation. You let Christ in your life. Let him live his spotless life again in you. Paul says, not I live, but Christ liveth in me. And he says, if that's true, then my motivation has been purified. And from that pure motivation, good deeds will flow. So Christianity says a new motivation purifies the action. And Judaism says new action, good action, purifies the motivation. Two different theories of human nature as well as two different theories of salvation, but closely related. And they have a lot to teach each other. I think there's great truth in each religion. I think God is speaking to us in both of them. And when we talk to each other and Jewish-Christian dialogue goes on, I just was planning with some priests and rabbis a program we're having on the Second Vatican Council, decisions on Jews and Christians' relations. We're doing them in Charleston this fall should be some very interesting speakers speaking. And we're going to examine the relationship over the last 50 years with these two religions, which used to be at each other's throats because they said, no, we're right. We're the only Israel. And the Christians said, we're the new Israel. You were cast, when we came in, you were cast off. Now the church is saying, you weren't cast off. We didn't replace the Jews as God's people. We joined them. So the Catholic churches, church and, the, and most Protestant churches today say that the Jews are in an eternal covenant with God, which was not canceled by the Christ event, and the church is in a new covenant, also eternal with God, and we both are in covenant with God, and we're covenant partners. And the Catholic Church has dropped its project to convert the Jews, as has the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, the uh, Presbyterians. All the mainline churches now see Jews as partners for dialogue rather than candidates for conversion. The Southern Baptists still want to convert the Jews. Uh, they're not going to succeed any more than they've been succeeding for 40 centuries. Uh, the Jews believe that they are the people of God and they're going to stick with the old faith. 
in my family is half Jewish and half Presbyterian. Some of them are converted and some have not. Uh, I think it's a matter of integrity. And if somebody con sincerely converts, I honor that. But also to stick with the old faith that God made me a Jew and he put me here and this is my station and this is where I stand. And it doesn't mean my religion is any truer than Christianity. We have lots to say to each other and in dialogue we can, there are things that Judaism is weak on that Christianity is strong on. And the things that Christianity is weak on that Judaism is strong on. And the more we talk with each other, the more we can enrich each other. Yes. It seems to be another thing that separates the Jews and the Christians. I know being a Baptist, growing up as a Baptist, God was perfect. He never wrestled with himself. But the Jews? I think so. In Judaism, you can shake your fist in God's face and say, wait a minute. You say to people, to be an Israelite is to say to the people and the human race, stop it. Stop sinning. And I talk to myself, of course, too. There's a holy God here. Stop it. But then to turn to God and say, you stop it. Because there are people here, innocent people. And you can't destroy Sodom just because you feel like doing it. And God agreed with Abraham, that Abraham was right. In that dialogue, Abraham became the conscience of God. Usually God is our conscience, whispering in our ear what to do. But in that story, we now have the right to say to God, wait, wait a minute, what about birth defects? What about cancer? All right, if I live in a state where there's terrible air pollution and I smoke and all this, well, I'm bringing it on myself. But birth defects, there are, there are things that I think are wrong and I have a right to protest them. Whether God will listen or not, I don't know. But to argue with God is a Jewish tradition. It's not very big in Christianity, but it is in Judaism. And it's very pious. We feel so intimately connected with our Father that we can argue with him. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Keep reading, brother, brother, keep reading. It gets better and better. Okay. Thank you all, and we'll meet next week.